this thing. With that, I give you Ron Swinson, who will talk about the challenge that the Hubbard Peak really gives to humanity. Good afternoon. Um, I'd like to talk about solar energy, because that's what we're all about here in this community, and discuss how I think that our community can become more capable of addressing the concerns that we see here listed. Uh, at the bottom of the screen, I've listed a, a, a web address, ecotopia.com slash ISIS, and from there, there will be links to these PowerPoint presentations and to some other material that we've developed. Uh, Frank and I authored a paper. Uh, you can get it in the proceedings, but you can also see it there. And then at various stages along the way, I'll also list at the bottom of the screen places in w which you can see the details of the items that I've described here. Oh. Well, I, I want to give a, a quick lesson in how to tell whether somebody's telling the truth or not about the future of oil. And I refer to these people such as the International Energy Agency, the Energy Information Agency of the United States, the oil companies, the, some of the governments, a fellow named Lynch and Edelman, Jurgen, and our, our champion, uh, Amory Lovins. People like this are what I call the pretenders because they're saying that there's always going to be more. And if they're running out of paper like this, what you have to do is take up a collection for those people so that they can help us see what the rest of the curve looks like. And uh, from this address, you can see more information. Uh, an another case closer to home, there are commissions and groups that get together. One is called the National Commission on Energy Policy. They produce a marvelous book. It's a couple inches thick. And it says at the, in the page one of the document, the commission does not embrace the view that world oil production has peaked. Well, technically, that's correct. But what they go on to say is, don't worry, be happy. Although, by the way, we need to start coming up with more efficiency and more of this and more of that. And I call it rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic. And I want to give you a little bit of an indication of why that's so. First of all, there's been a flurry of books on the subject of peak oil and beyond oil, Hubbard's Peak, Party's Over, Long Emergency, The End of Oil, Over a Barrel. And all of these documents have something in common that I want you to take a look at. This one says, at the moment, solar and wind power are developing in specialized areas, and neither is an immediate large-scale solution to the energy problem. Solar electrical generation is not yet competitive for large-scale facilities. To my surprise, solar cells cost $16 a watt, if you want to do the math there. Uh, photovoltaic electricity is still expensive. Now, mind you, technically these guys aren't all necessarily wrong, but if you read uh, this information in context, you will see that what they're saying is, don't worry about this, it's not going to help us. Solar energy is still too expensive by a factor of four. This is quoting uh, our buddy Paul Maycock. Now, again, this is, was true a couple of years ago, probably when this book was written, but you know, when you read the rest of it, you'll discover that they're saying that solar is, has a bad reputation and costs are prohibitive. But all of them combined, solar, wind, everything else, can never produce enough energy to replace fossil fuels. And yet, when you look at the solar energy input from the sun to the earth, 178,000 terawatts going on right now as we sit here, and the total energy used by human society is 10 terawatts. So if the sun isn't sufficient, I'm afraid I don't understand this upside down mathematics. Now, mind you, some of it's absorbed and reflected back into space. Some of it goes to photosynthesis. But give me a break. If we can't figure out a way to take the sun's energy and put it to good use, we're, we're missing something here. And we've got, I think, a little bit to work with. Sun power technology is still in the Stone Age. I encourage you to look at hubbardpeak.com slash Youngquist, where Youngquist points out that, indeed, we are still in the Stone Age because, for example, in the United States, we consume 20,000 pounds per capita of, of uh, stone, concrete, aggregates, uh, marble, and all that kind of stuff in construction and what all. The long emergency, same story. 
I think you're catching on here, so I'll move along. I think these people are trying to tell us something, but wait. Economics is an instrument of policy. What I mean by that is that when somebody tells you solar isn't economic, what they're really telling you is solar energy is not politic. It hasn't gotten the political support, and we're living at the tail end of a, of a, a momentum that works against us. So how do we beat that rap? How do we come to terms with that? And I want to start by showing you what would happen if we started meeting the deficit that we're facing uh, with uh, an alternative. So here comes uh, at a three, what we're talking about here is as, this, as we go down the, the, the rear slope of the Hubbard curve that we're going to see a 3% decline per year. What if we did that, filled that up with renewables over a period of 25 years? So what happens is that a, a renewable system comes in and it starts filling in that gap. It makes an annual contribution of this amount. And if we take all that and we add it together like this, we find out that we might have, say, 75 percent. Uh, but there's another little detail, is that there's an embodied energy to make that solar equipment, which brings our total down to 60. And we have to do something with that. We have to look at how that takes in and absorbs some of the, the the energy in society that we're now using for running the place, okay? So all the people out there that are maintaining the system are in that 85% category and the, and the other 15% is the amount of energy that it takes to produce the energy solution for the future. That's important. Now the next slide kind of ties this all together. This is actually a very perceptive uh, curve that was done about 20 years ago when the uh, book, the first Beyond Oil book was written. And it shows that if we get started early in making the transition, we don't have to bite so deeply into the, the uh, homeostasis of our regular economy. And that instead we go into, uh, a, but on the other hand, if, if it takes longer to get around to doing something about it, then we're going to dig deeper and deeper into the total amount of energy we have available in society. So yesterday there was a speaker who said that we were going to hit the peak in 2030. Now this is a member of our own community. If people talk like that and it turns out to be 2010, if, we, if we're preparing for a problem that's 20 years out and it turns out to be five years out, this is what we're, what we're facing. We're facing a scramble in which we're going to have to bore into what we have and, and the society is going to be in the, in the danger of collapse because we don't have enough to make up for the energy economy of the future. And so I'm really talking about embodied energy. And if you look at the thermodynamics of coal, for example, the paybacks really aren't all that great when you take a, I'm using barrels of oil equivalent here to kind of get the idea across. And I don't know the numbers in this. I'm sorry that I didn't have time to research this one out. Some of the others I'm going to give you an example here are more to the point, and I know a little more about them. But in the case of each of these resources that we're using now, if you take a barrel of oil equivalent, a, a, a ton of coal or whatever, you get three back, or five back maybe. I don't know quite what it is for coal. But it all, isn't all that great in this, Frank point out. You have ravaged land, water contamination, people being displaced. And in fact, while we're extracting the oil, the, the coal, we're using oil in all of the machinery that goes to doing this, not to mention uh, global warming, right? So now, the thermodynamics of oil, a little different. It really depends on where you are. In Pennsylvania, there are 20,000 um, uh, 20, wells that produce, what is it, Frank, about a total of 5,000 barrels a day. So it's a quarter of a barrel a day per well. And they're still pumping away. In Saudi Arabia, it's obviously the other way around, maybe 20, 30, 50. Uh, where I come from in California, it's not uncommon for enhanced oil recovery to give us about a three to one ratio. So here I've got a barrel of oil, which could be used for making solar panels, hello. <laughs> and instead what we're doing is we're doing after more oil. The energy economics don't make a whole lot of sense. I mean, it's better than nothing. Uh, and it's better than treading water, but it's not the best use of our remaining energy reserves, especially when you think about that previous curve I showed, which says we've got to use some of what we've got 
to make up for what we're going to have later. Uh, not to mention, as I said before, all the other side effects of oil spills and collapsing oil platforms and the like. Now, I know a little more about this because this is a better understood number and it's more consistent. Tar sands give you about three barrels of oil equivalent for every barrel of oil you plow into making it happen. And that adds its own share of greenhouse gases, ravaged land, and so on and so forth. Oh, and by the way, up in Canada, they're using an awful lot of natural gas to extract the tar sands. Hello. <laughs> so, now, the thermodynamics of nuclear, I did a little research on this one, and I was amazed that the, all, for all the hype that we have about nuclear power, you know, being too cheap to meter and all that, and having a comeback, I'm sorry I don't get it. Now, since the days when we first started, it's gotten better. But there's an incredible amount of embodied energy in making a nuclear power plant. There's an incredible amount of, of uh, energy taken up by consuming for the, the uh, processing of ore. And the ore is getting steadily worse and worse. And I, uh, in this report, uh, on, the, on the website, you can dig into this if you want to find out more about this. That, that people are saying that, the, the, that actually the, the numbers on the left are probably more realistic. Two, three, four to one is about all we're getting at the end of the day. And each year that goes by and the quality of the, of the ores go down, what you find out is surprisingly that, that nuclear power is a really poor energy investment. Now remember we're talking about mother nature here. We're not talking about what sort of superficial spin we can put on it by a government policy that distorts the underlying natural economics, which I'll call thermodynamics, thank you. Oh, oh by the way, we might have a, a, a place where there's a 10,000 years we have to set aside. I don't know how long it might be, a thousand years, who knows, but this is not the, any way to run a railroad. Uh, the thermodynamics of hydrogen, I'm sorry, some of you think it's a pretty good thing, and in some ways it is, it could be possible, but in, in any case, uh, I think there are a lot of people promoting hydrogen economy because they're trying to promote nuclear power or clean coal or some kind of deliberate distraction. But again, when you take a, a unit of energy, what you get back when you go through the hydrogen cycle is something less than a unit of energy. We can argue about the, the details, but it's something between 30% on a practical basis to maybe 60% if somebody gets really serious about it. Why not just do pumped hydro? and have pure electric vehicles. Any uh, plug hydro fans out there? <laughs> so, okay. Um, now you get the thermodynamics of PV. The little twist in the thing is that when you have crystalline solar panels, they're gonna last, I'm sure, 50 years and probably more like 100 years. Trouble is that with five years of, of in energy, embodied energy, it takes five years, in other words, to get your energy back. It might be 50 years uh, but, but the nice thing is we can take some of that and we can start breeding more. We get to thin film, people are claiming, uh, I think there's some justification for this, substantially better returns. When you go to wind, it's even better. So what it comes down to is thermodynamics versus economics. Policy cannot defeat Mother Nature in the long run. In other words, in the long run, thermodynamics wins. And I think we have to pay attention to that. The solar industry response has been to enact, modify, establish, boost, support, increase, strengthen, grow. But none of these, these challenges that we've created for ourselves is worth a damn because it's not coming anywhere close to the kind of level we're going to need to fill the gap. And I think we have to revisit these things in light of the data that Roger Bentley and the others here are talking about today. We are not doing enough and a hundred million dollars per year into the federal government is not where it's at. It's not going to cut it. We need to do more. So I have Swenson's Law in conclusion. To avoid deprivation resulting from exhaustion of non-renewable resources, humanity must employ conservation and renewable resource substitutes sufficient to match depletion. If we don't do that, we're in trouble. We are not doing enough. To spend our depleting energy capital, we must first understand the thermodynamics, which is the energy return on energy invested amongst the alternatives and pick the ones that work and push that policy and make clear to the policymakers that an investment in these other things is taking us down the primrose path. Economics or thermodynamics, which will we choose? Can solar substitute for oil? Yes, think terawatts, thank you.